Hi, welcome to the analysis.news. I'm Paul Jay. Uh, we'll be back in just a few seconds with Bob Poland. And we're going to talk about just where is Biden's climate agenda? Because at the moment, it seems like it's kind of nowhere. Uh, we're also going to talk about inflation. And we'll be back in just a few seconds. Uh, please don't forget there's a donate button, a subscribe button, a share button, all the buttons. Be back in just a few seconds. So it looks like Build Back Better, Biden's big infrastructure plan, which was supposed to include a major component that would deal with the climate change crisis. Uh, and while you know, on this show, we've already talked about the inadequacies of that plan, it at least was something. It wasn't nothing. Well, now it might be getting back to almost nothing, given that Biden can't get the Democratic Party can't get this passed, more or less because of at least a couple of members of their own party. Uh, Bernie Sanders recently in an interview with the Guardian newspaper said the Democratic Party is abandoning the working class. When I when I just said this to our guest, Bob Poland, he said, oh, what news is <laughs> that? What news is that? Um, at any rate, now joining us to talk all about all of that, but we're going to start with the issue of inflation, is Bob Poland. Bob's the co-founder of the Perry Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He's a regular uh, on the analysis.news. Thanks for joining me, Bob. Very happy to be on, Paul. Thanks for having me. So a few months ago, we did an interview and we talked about inflation and we're going to get into that. I, I do want to make just one comment first on the climate side, which is sort of the, the bigger issue, but we are going to start with inflation, is the way the media keeps framing this issue of build back better not passing and what's going to happen. It's, it's all about the uh, fortune, bad fortune and future of, of the Democratic Party. Well, this isn't a great crisis for the Democratic Party. Maybe it is, but it's a heck of a lot bigger crisis for humanity because as, as uh, weak as the climate plan was, at least there was a conversation about a climate plan. Uh, let's do that big picture first, and then we're, we'll get into inflation. Sure. Uh, well, by the way, the two things are interrelated, as we can talk about when we talk about inflation. But you know, the, the Build Back Better program uh, that Biden introduced, when was it? In March of last year, um, at about $3.4 trillion for everything. Uh, the climate air was one part of it was about one third. And then issues around um, child care support, um, support for um, home care, uh, pharmaceutical prices and so forth. That was in about the other two thirds. Um, you know, when we talked about it uh, before, the, the at, at 3.4 trillion, so if we say 1 trillion uh, was climate roughly, and that's over 10 years. So that's about $100 billion per year for government support for investments in climate. Um, you could, I could make an argument that that was like barely adequate for lifting off into a real climate sustainable investment path. Uh, but now that we're at half of that um, in terms of the overall program, uh, at least as being discussed in Washington as of today, and that that half, so that would be, let's say, 50 billion for for uh, climate. And that even that looks like it might not pass. On top of that, not only was there money involved in investments in climate, there were regulations that were critical that would say, you know, utilities had to achieve the renewable portfolio standard, meaning they had to increase their share of renewable energy. That was regulatory. That was not mo money coming out of taxpayers' pockets. It was a regulation. It was up to the utilities to figure out how to get there. That was a very powerful tool. But uh, Senator Manchin uh, uh, forced the uh, elimination of that one way, way back. So we're back in terms of these uh, tax subsidies. It's not nearly enough. 
Um, and it's probably not going to pass, at least, at least as far as I can read tea leaves. All right. Well, we're going to come back to the climate issue. Let's let's move to inflation and then come back to climate. So last time we interviewed a few months ago, we talked about inflation and, and the headline was uh, a little bit inflation is not so bad. And you were arguing that a little bit of inflation, and, and you said most of the inflation that's coming is really coming from energy prices. But if, it's, if there's a small effect of inflation that's connected to the rise of workers' wages, um, that's not so bad. And then I got all kinds of email. What is Poland saying? Inflation's not bad. Look at my cost of food. Um, well, your argument wasn't dealing with, you were saying if the inflation is from a little rise in wages, that the rise in wages is normally a little more than the rise in inflation. So that's good. But we've seen a lot more than, than that. So where are we at and, and, and what, where, how long do you think this is going to last? So if we look at the most recent data that just came out uh, this week, so the overall uh, the broadest measure of inflation, the one that's quoted, is the consumer price index. That showed us for the last year that prices went up by 7%, which is the highest rate of inflation since 1982. Okay, but if you break that down, there's really three big factors in the inflation right now. One is that wages have gone up so that the uh, costs, the average costs of hiring a worker are up uh, by about three and a half percent. So that's about half of the increase in wages, uh, half the increase 7% increase in overall inflation. Wages have gone up or, or business costs of, of labor have gone up by about 3.5%. So that's half. Uh, but the other half is really two, really only two things. I just was looking at it right before we got on. Uh, one of them is used car prices. Um, and the other is uh, oil prices. If you add those three things up, uh, oil prices, used car prices, wages, that explains the entire inflation. So um, the wages, the wage part of it, and I mean, it's not distributed evenly. Not all workers' wages have gone up equally, of course. Um, the highest wage increases have been in, uh, you know, food service and hospitality. And these are people, you know, their wages, of course, went down. They were laid off. And now the wages have come back. And it's hard to attract people. Now, the reason it's hard to attract people is because the, there were such lousy jobs before. And there are even worse jobs now because of COVID. They're un, not, not safe. Uh, and the other, uh, the other wages that have gone up relatively hot, fast are in, you know, healthcare, hospital workers. So they're getting wage increases. They're getting wage increases that are um, above the inflation rate. Um, so that's a positive. Now, keep in mind, again, their, their wage increases are happening from a very low base. So they're still lousy jobs. And that's why you're also seeing this phenomenon of people quitting their jobs. You're having the highest quit rates uh, in decades maybe ever as since the numbers have been measured. You know, you're seeing about 4% of the labor force quitting their jobs. Um, so you have relatively low unemployment. You have high quit rates. You have wage increases happening uh, for the lowest paid workers. So those are all relatively positive developments. And it could be a lot worse. I mean, coming out of, you know, the recession, you know, half of the labor force was laid off due to COVID at one point or another. So these are, are fairly positive developments. On the, the, on the energy side, yeah, oil prices have gone up by 50% since last year. Uh, Bob, when that overall inflation rate of 7%, but that doesn't really get at the prices that ordinary working people 
are facing for daily life, because if I'm right, I'm just looking at these numbers here, Bureau of Labor Statistics from November, uh, beef went up 24%. Um, as you said, gasoline's up around 50, but like natural gas up 28%, but, but like bacon's up 20%, eggs are up 12%. Uh, like you said, used cars are up 26%. Right. So here's what I'm looking, if I may, I'm looking at the same. <laughs> I'm looking at, the, the as of today, the consumer price index. So yeah, meat, poultry, fish, eggs up 12.5%. So that's higher than the 7%. Um, but if you look, that's only that's less than 2% of the overall index. The big action is, yeah, uh, oil is at almost 50%, and it's 4 0.3% of the whole index. So that's that that gives you a t overall increase of 2.2%. Used cars, 37% increase, and that's 3.4% of the overall index. That gets you to another 1.2%. Uh, uh, so between oil and used cars, that gets you about 3.5% of the 7% overall in index. And the other three and a half percent, roughly, is uh, uh, equivalent to the wage or the labor cost increases, and that's basically the story. But but still, food is like up around the twelve percent mark. Well, food overall, I'm looking, is six point three percent. So food is less than the overall seven percent increase. And so, of course, when we talk about food, the big one of the big factors in the production of food, as opposed to oil, labor is a, a much bigger component. So when the labor share is going up, that means that the food prices will go up also. Also, the cost of transportation is way up with fuel. So it comes back to a lot of it is fuel again. Yes, fuel fuel and then we also have the business with with the cars and the cars is basically this supply uh chain the shortage of uh semiconductor of computer chips semiconductors and that's what's driving the, the automobile prices because they can't produce new cars fast enough so it's really if you had to boil it down it's really Computer chips making it hard to build cars. It is uh, oil prices through the roof, and it is something that is a favorable development in general, which is wages going up. Uh, so if you take these two things, what can be done? Now, the semiconductor shortage uh, has, if I understand it correctly, is mostly because American companies, including Intel, decided it was just cheaper to offshore the production to Taiwan and then South Korea. And so in order to save money on wages, they created this crazy global supply chain that with the pandemic, they didn't know how many chips to make. They didn't know how long there'd be a recession. And now they're com everybody's competing to quickly try to create new semiconductor manufacturing, but it's very complicated. It comes from I, I, my understanding is there's one major company in the Netherlands that makes all the machines that make semiconductors, and they have a very limited capacity. So it's at least apparently five years to put up some new uh, semiconductor capacity outside of Taiwan and uh, South Korea. And then, of course, Taiwan's caught in all the controversy with China. And China also buys semiconductors from Taiwan. And so the semiconductor thing's a mess, which is part of the whole, this whole irrational, chaotic global capitalist system. But yeah, so uh, I read an interesting article the other day about Tesla, which does not have a, a, a supply shortage. And the reason they don't have a supply shortage is in, <clears throat> in, the, in developing the software for their cars, they kept in-house their uh, software design so that when the semiconductor shortage emerged, they simply rewrote the programs so that it wouldn't entail the same amount of semiconductors as computer chips. They were able to reduce 
significantly the number of computer chips simply by rewriting the program. Whereas the other major auto manufacturers had, had outsourced all of this. And so they are, have no capacity to rewrite their uh, software to run the cars. So that's why Tesla, and you, as you know, Tesla, their market value is, <laughs> is now, uh, what, two and a half trillion or something like that. Uh, so they, they are uh, totally outpacing all of the other car companies because of the way they have maintained in-house capacity, capability in writing software. Well, there's nothing the Biden administration in any short term way like is going to be able to do about the semiconductor situation. Right. Is there anything they can do about the cost of oil? Well, here's what I've been thinking about, because, uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, we have this severe problem of inflation tied largely with the cost of oil. On the other hand, when we switch and talk about climate, we want people to consume less fossil fuels. And therefore, I mean, one of the proposals has been out there, which is to um, tax fossil fuels, to tax uh, carbon. And in my own uh, UMass colleague, Jim Boyce, originally developed the idea of what he called tax and dividend or tax and rebate. So you jack up the price of fossil fuels through a tax, you get the revenue and you rebate it back to people that they will they will not be hurt in terms of their standard of living. But hang on for a sec. But the objective here is the industrial use of fossil fuel. It would be an incentive to find other ways to produce power and, and industrial power, electricity because they wouldn't get rebated, if I'm understanding it correctly. Well, I mean, this is just a very vague idea. But the, uh, the point being that uh, we would you ha you want to maintain the high i think we need to keep oil prices high and prevent and discourage consumption and encourage renewable energy clean energy but we don't want it to have a negative impact on people's living standard and especially uh people middle class and, and lower income people where the share the of energy consumption in their overall day to day basket is high, is much higher than high income people. So we, ha we should therefore subsidize, pay back everybody uh, a rebate, effectively rebate, um, uh, so that they aren't hurt while the price of oil is so high. Okay. But that's based on this idea that you'd increase taxes and out of those taxes, you get a rebate. But what, right. do you, what's, what are they going to do now? So, yeah, it wouldn't be based on taxes. Effectively, yeah, the money is going to the oil companies. So that's bad. So the only other, the next step would therefore have to be what we have talked about before is really it's time to nationalize the oil companies. It really is. Uh, there's no reason not to. The I just checked the market value of the U.S. oil companies as of the latest data I could get. Is roughly about eight hundred billion dollars for all U.S. oil companies. Um, that means you could buy a fifty-one percent share, controlling share of the oil companies, for four hundred billion dollars thereabouts. Uh, that four hundred billion dollars is about one tenth of what the Federal Reserve pumped into Wall Street starting in March twenty twenty. Over the over the subsequent year, they pumped in four trillion to buy the bonds of uh, of Wall Street firms to keep them afloat. So, I know this is not something that's on the immediate political agenda, but I really think it's something that if we really are going to have a a viable climate program, we simply have to expropriate the oil companies. And hey. If you buy their shares at market value, the shareholders should be what they should be fine with it. Uh, just take over controlling interest. Well, in theory, then there'd be two objectives of doing that. One is if you control the oil companies, you can control the phasing out of fossil fuel fuel in the United States. Right. But you could also decide to lower the profit expectation 
on the selling of the oil, because I've seen stats before, and I assume it's still true. This was a few years ago. I mean, you would think the, the, the ratio of fuel company profit shouldn't change that much if the price of oil goes up, because the oil, the big fossil fuel companies, in theory, are buying oil on the global market, and their profit net shouldn't change that much. But what I saw is actually that's not true. The higher our oil prices get, the more profit these companies make. They find ways to increase their net in spite of their own costs going up. Uh, so in theory, if you nationalize, uh, you could force the prices down. Uh, at, at, if nothing else, even in could Biden even pass, he'll never do this, but an executive order forcing the prices down? Well, I mean, if the if the government owned the oil companies, yeah, you can, if the government owned the oil companies, you can lower the prices, maintain some profitability, and then the profits can be plowed into developing alternative energy. And you also eliminate, obviously, in one fell swoop, all the lobbying, uh, the relentless lobbying of the oil companies to fight against uh, a, cl a viable climate program. So, but, so in terms of short term, the inflationary pressure, which has caused oil, oil, I'm not sure if you know, but what percentage of the increase of the cost of food is the cost of oil? Because when they, I know when I look at this number, 51 percent increase in the price of gasoline. But that doesn't take into account how much that increase in the price of gasoline causes an increase in the cost of food, That's which right. I, it must be significant. It does feed through because, yeah, I mean, it's it's about four and a half percent of the overall economy. So it feeds into everything, um, including food. And so, the yeah, and transportation feeds into everything. So in terms of the transportation share, I mean, another climate merging the climate solutions with an anti-inflation program is to expand public transportation. Uh, like, I mean, that's something you can do quickly. Put more buses out on the street uh, or hire more bus drivers and run the buses more frequently um, and, and lower the cost of public transportation to make it really easy for people to, uh, to take the bus and therefore not need to have two cars. Um, any kind of, you know, even a, there, you know, the total number of automobiles in the United States is so large, it's roughly the size of the entire population. So uh, any reduction, any increase in public transportation use is going to have a, a significant impact on lowering the demand for cars and therefore reducing prices. And of course, it also has a positive impact on climate. Now, there's a geopolitical piece to this. Uh, it's not just some you know, mysterious supply and demand, uncontrollable supply and demand that's causing this rise in, in oil prices. It's because the Saudis and, and others in OPEC, but you know, it's the Saudis being the giant on the stage, uh, deliberately restrict how much oil they pump out in order to keep the prices high. Um, the Saudis are in a position to do this because the United States allows the monarchy uh, to have such power. And of course, the Saudis, I, I just saw a number, it was in the trillions of dollars, the amount of money the Saudis have invested in the U.S. economy and how much they own of, of major corporation after major corporation. And clearly, it's in the interest of the Saudis to sink the Democrats uh, elect Republicans and bring in a, a, a government of climate change deniers. Uh, but again, here the Biden administration is, is mute. They, you know, they claimed they were going to, you know, punish the Saudis and make them get out of Yemen and all this. They're doing next to nothing on that. Uh, and we're back to business as usual with the Saudis. Well, look, yes, I mean the oil, the oil industry is. Uh, oligopolistic. So there's, yeah, Saudis, Russia. Um, but the U.S. companies are, are not exactly innocent in all this. Uh, so they're very happy that when OPEC jacks up their prices and restricts supply, that's good for them too. We do have to remember that, you know, a year and a half ago, the price of oil was negative uh, that, you know, because of the COVID crisis, 
uh, demand had fallen so low that you couldn't literally they they were they had to oil companies had to uh, give away the oil because they were they were oversupplied. So that is part of the story. Uh, but you know, in the re as the economy has recovered, of course, the oligopolistic pricing power of the U.S. companies, of the Saudis, of the Russians, uh, they are taking advantage of it and they're jacking up the price. So the price now, uh, the average oil price is, you know, about 20 percent higher than it was pre-COVID. So that's really a good measure of where they are in terms of pricing power. Uh, the other thing nationalizing the oil companies would do um, is that you could actually have an increase for a while in the production of domestic oil, because in fact, there is enough oil and natural gas in the US and certainly between US and Canada. If you had a real plan for quickly moving over to sustainable energy and in the sh very short term, increase production domestically or in North American production because it's now government owned and, the, and thus lower the price of domestic energy, uh, you could deal with inflation and you could have this plan move to uh, sustainable energy, but it all goes back to nationalization. Yeah, no, we could. There's, I mean, there, there doesn't seem to be any really uh, immediate viable way to move on to a, a climate stabilization path as long as the oil companies, domestic and foreign, have basically the capacity to sabotage. I mean, this that's what, you know, Biden goes to the COP26 meeting in Scotland and he's saying, we're going to be a leader. We're getting off of oil. And then the next day he begs the oil companies to expand production. So there's a contradiction there, a pretty obvious contradiction. And, you know, there is a rationale because of the price of oil going up so fast. Uh, so in order to be able to control this transition, we have to have some control over the price of oil and the supply. And, you know, it, if, the, if the Federal Reserve can bail out Wall Street with $4 trillion, then the Federal Reserve can buy up 51% of the oil, the U.S. oil industry for $400 billion. Uh, so not only will Biden not even take a look at the idea of nationalizing uh, the oil industry, and, and 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 he should also be aware, even from a most narrow political point of view, uh, the fossil fuel industry overwhelmingly uh, financed the Republican Party in the last uh, election. And it's one of the reasons the Republicans did so well, even though Trump lost, the, the Republican Party itself did extremely well in the last election. And it's looking like they'll do it even better in, in 2022. And a, a large portion of their money is coming from fossil fuel. And that's no surprise. But there's another thing the Biden administration could be doing, which would help take the legs out of Joe Manchin. Uh, and this is something you've been talking about over and over again, which is a real just transition for fossil fuel workers. The Biden administration could tell West Virginians, uh, you are not going to lose a penny because we are going to subsidize your wages as we transition away from coal. But they don't do that either. So, you know, I, we've talked about, yeah, I, among other places, I wrote a, a just transition program for West Virginia. And I met with Manchin staff and we met with labor leaders and uh, uh, political officials throughout the state. Uh, people were all for it, including the uh, head of the coal miners union, which is why, at least according to rumors that I read, uh, Manchin is not against the in, uh, climate part of Build Back Better. He's against the other parts. And I think the reason why he may not, it may be a little softer on the climate parts is exactly that he's gotten pressure from even the union leadership, the mine workers union leadership in West Virginia, because <clears throat> in, in Build Back Better, there is a decent uh transition program incorporated into it. Uh, but if it doesn't, if the bill doesn't pass, of course, there's no transition program. So, you know, one of the things in our study, it showed, uh, you know, a decent transition in West Virginia, investing into making West Virginia a leader in clean energy would create about 25,000 jobs a year. 
At the same time, the phase out of fossil fuels, uh, including coal and uh, they do have oil and natural gas, we're looking at a couple of thousand jobs per year, even in West Virginia. So we have essentially a tenfold improvement in overall job opportunity in West Virginia um, through a uh, transition. So why the hell isn't Biden you know, hammering this message in West Virginia? I know. I know. Uh, well, the only answer can be is he doesn't want to antagonize the fossil fuel companies, but they're already funding the Republicans up the wazoo. Yeah. Well, the other thing that needs to be considered is that the fossil fuel companies are not like some uh, separate thing. Most of the big fossil fuel companies, their primary ownership goes right back to Wall Street now. It's not like there's such a wall between, oh, yeah. which, is, which is the backers of the Democratic Party. One of the ironies, we've talked about this also. One of the ironies of the divestment movement, and I am wholly supportive of the spirit and the aims of the divestment movement. One of the ironies, which I pointed out in some research, but is is definitely happened, is that okay when when UMass Amherst or the Council of Churches say we're going to divest all of our fossil fuel assets, um, somebody is buying them, and guess who's buying them? <laughs> Uh, hedge funds are buying them, uh, private equity funds. They are the main. When we talk about the fossil fuel companies, we are exactly, as you say, we are now talking about basically uh, leading Wall Street firms, Blackstone and so forth, that have bought up uh, at, at some discount the fossil fuel asset shares uh, because, it, well, in small part because of the divestment movement. But the big factor was, of course, the collapse of the, of the fossil fuel industry during the initial months of COVID. They bought them up on the cheap. The fossil fuel industry was worth half of what it is now uh, uh, a year and a half ago. What a good time to nationalize. <laughs> right, exactly. We've lost that opportunity, but it's still, it's still uh, eminently affordable compared to other things that we've done. Well, I'm going to be interviewing in a couple of weeks uh, a woman who's the head of an organization called West Virginia Can't Wait. And they're talking about organizing in West Virginia, because while I, I don't think there's much to expect from the Biden administration and corporate Democrats, um, there is some success in, in, in actually on the ground organizing in West Virginia that, that might change the character of electoral politics there. And, and they are talking to coal miners about what a just a real just transition looks like. Uh, so, you know, I don't think it's all gloom and doom there that they've been at it for about three and a half years and, and have had some real successes. So we're, we'll, we'll know more because clearly that's where the future, if there is one, is going to be. Well, yeah. So, I mean, the people that commissioned my study uh, um, Reimagine Appalachia. I would guess that your or the woman you're organizing is affiliated. So it, it, they're an outstanding group, um, and um, yeah, yes, they their work uh, has definitely gotten in, integrated into debates in West Virginia. Um, and in fact, Manchin himself called uh, one of the leaders of the group after this guy. Uh, he put out an, an op-ed in a local West Virginia paper on these issues. Manchin called him. Uh, Manchin obviously felt defensive about it and called him. So, uh, yeah, and, and then when the leader of the United Mine Workers, uh, Cecil Roberts, I think his name is, came out and said, yeah, we support a just transition program for our workers, for our membership. This is the future. Uh, create jobs and clean energy and support workers transitioning and support the communities transitioning. It's pretty straightforward. I mean, we laid it out in, in great detail. So uh, why doesn't Manchin do it? Uh, that's, yeah, that's, an, he'll have to answer that question. Well, I think we know the answer. I think it was The Intercept, uh, it may have been another outlet, but I think it was The Intercept got hold of a transcript of a phone call Manchin had had with his, uh, some big corporate and wealthy backers. And they were simply issuing him directives, one of which was don't cooperate with any change in the filibuster rule in the Senate. 
uh, don't do this, don't do that, essentially sink the Biden uh, bill. So even when the uh, president that you just mentioned of the mine workers came out a couple of weeks ago and called on Manchin to support this legislation, uh, it still hasn't changed Manchin's vote. Uh, we, I guess it's pretty clear how captured he is. Of course, the problem for the Democrats is if they push Manchin too hard, he's, you know, there's this always this threat he'll go over to the Republican Party and they'll lose all their chairmanships of the uh, Senate committees and so on and so on. I mean, they should have done this a long time ago, uh, weakened the hand of Manchin. And of course, it's also this woman from, uh, where is she, Arizona. And others, too. I mean, they're the ones that are just out front. But this goes back to the way the corporate Democrats have always fought against progressive ch primary challengers uh, to such corporate Dems. Uh, the, the establishment of the party has already always tried to block uh, challenges to people like Manchin. Uh, so it's a, it's a somewhat paralyzed situation, except for the kind of organizing that we're going to talk about a lot more. Uh, it, what, Sanders issued this uh, interview with The Guardian. Uh, what can be done, do you think, at this stage? Some people are saying, OK, forget this enormous package of legislation, parcel it into smaller pieces and try to pass that. Uh, I mean, what what? What gets out of the paralysis? Because right now, 2022 is looking like a disaster, uh, not just for the Democratic Party, but for humanity, because it's going to bring climate deniers into control of at least one and maybe both houses. Yeah, I mean, I was just uh, talking to people in uh, South Korea yesterday, because I'm doing work there with Greenpeace. Um, and, uh, you know, they said, what's up with uh, Build Back Better? Because that's really, that's going to, that's the thing that everyone is looking toward, not just in the U.S., but globally. We really need something. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, again, uh, just reading the press, uh, reading the press, it's saying that Manchin is, actually not so much opposed to the climate parts of the Build Back Better. He's opposed to the other parts. He's opposed to uh, giving the child care credit without a work requirement. He's opposed. OK, well, let, let's dig into that just for a minute. Uh, his main argument is supposedly it's inflationary. I mean, the real argument because he also gives this, and I think this has always been the real uh, objection coming from the Republican Party, is they don't like that it, it it weakens, quote unquote, you know, workers' discipline, working class discipline. In other words, desperation. You know, the more desperate the workers are, the the conditions they'll accept are inferior. Uh, I think that's the real heart of it. But is there anything to the argument that giving people five hundred bucks or two hundred and fifty bucks a month for their kids is inflationary? Um. Okay, so the you know the idea that you the worker you don't want workers to uh, feel less desperate to have more power. I mean that argument was first developed by Karl Marx in in Das Kapital, Volume One, Chapter Twenty Five. So it's it's not a new argument, and uh, there is logic to it. And I think yet the answer is yes. If you give people um, benefits, then yeah, they will not show up at the job if the job is horrible. They have a better fallback position. And that's, you know, that's called uh, rigid labor markets, but it's also kind of a foundation of what we might consider a decent society, that people don't have to be absolutely desperate to show up at any job to avoid destitution, hunger. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they they might, I mean, you know, it depends on how much you give, of course, but if you give people some money to take care of their kids, um, as opposed to working three jobs, maybe only working two jobs, then maybe they won't show up at the third job. Uh, um, and then you may have to raise wages to get people to show up. And it gives workers more bargaining power. That is true. And that does, uh, you know, that kind of contradicts the basic logic of how capitalism works as described by comrade Carl in 1850. So uh, there is truth in it. On the let, me, let me just add one thing, one thing that in, and if you look at the Nordic countries, 
you know, whether it's Iceland or Finland or any of the other Scandinavian countries on the whole, uh, they have very uh, comparatively, and not as much as they used to, but still, very strong sa social safety nets. They have much higher unemployment insurance and, and on and on and on. And their productivity is consistently higher than the U.S. Uh, productivity. Yeah, and that's, that's yeah, well, we can get- I That's can another get conversation. That. But go on. So is it inflationary? Because that's supposedly what Manchin's concerned about. So the answer is, you know, it's always a matter of degree. Um, yeah, well, the tiny, 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 tiny bit. I mean, the 7% inflation that we're seeing now, no, it would have no impact or no discernible impact. Again, you know, half of the story of, of inflation today is oil prices and computer chips that are, you know, that are not available for cars. That's 50% of the story. And the other 50% are wage increases that are long, long, long overdue. And they, you know, and and this is after 40 years in which wages have stagnated. So that's the context in which we're seeing these modest wage increases. And they should go up. And that uh, the distribution of income should shift more towards workers and less towards Wall Street firms. And if that's happening to a very modest extent, and if workers could stay home as opposed to taking really lousy jobs, um, yeah, I think that would shift the distribution of income and power modestly to the workers. And yes, so that moves us ever so slightly towards the Nordic model in which you do have generous benefits. And as a consequence of that, that the higher productivity is part of the story because they know they can't get workers for really lousy pay. And so that they pay better. Uh, but they also expect higher productivity from workers and they get higher productivity. But is giving people 250 bucks per kid a month inflationary? Because that seems to be Manchin's big argument. Now, you know, you could, there's so many other ways you could pay for it without raising the deficit, whether it's reducing military spending or increasing taxation on the wealthy. I mean, in fact, isn't that part of the plan that you're going to pay for it through increased taxes? If we're just talking about the the impact on government spending and the and the deficit, no, that that's completely bogus argument. Even if what we're talking about, remember, it's one the bill is right now one point eight trillion dollars, but that's over ten years. So divided by ten, it's one hundred and eighty billion dollars in an economy that's you know that's uh, twenty three trillion. So this is less than 1% of the economy. So how can it have any significant impact on inflation? It can't. And they certainly had no concern about how much they juiced the stock market. Where, where were they complaining about inflation there? Well, and, you know, another way to say inflation, we can talk about, quote, asset inflation, which is the stock prices going up. We don't talk about that as a problem. That's something we celebrate. Whenever the stock prices are going up, we don't say, oh, my God, that's asset inflation or uh, uh, Wall Street prices are going up too fast. No, that's never a problem. Well, the, the hypocrisy of Manchin's position is is too apparent. And I'm hoping the organizers in West Virginia are going to be able to make this point to the West Virginian workers. And it was a good sign the union came out uh, against Manchin on this. Very good. Although in the past they have protected him. Uh, but maybe they're starting to, to see through this, one hopes. I think uh, they are. I think they are. The, let's, we just, in the last few minutes, let's go back to Sanders. Uh, I mean, Sanders during the primary against Hillary was very overt about the billionaire class that, you know, he denounced the oligarchs and so on and so on. Once Biden's elected, which Sanders supported in order to uh, oppose uh, outright climate deniers and uh, some form of perhaps American authoritarianism represented by, by Trump, uh, you know, he, by, uh, Sanders is, tr you know, helped design this Build Back Better plan and was in support of it. Um, now he seems to be reaching a point where he thinks not much is more is going to come out of this Democratic Party. Well, uh, that's certainly looking that way. I mean, 
but if we if we kind of think back and we say well you know if they had two more democratic senators uh that were not of the mansion cinema variety all of these things would have passed so you know we're fairly close to achieving something that might have been transformational we're also fairly close to descending into fascism so we're really at a knife's edge and i don't know that what the answer is i don't know that anybody knows but for the immediate i think yeah if we can thinking about west virginia if the labor movement can push mansion to at least support significant parts of this build back better bill and that people in West Virginia, for example, can see the benefits to themselves of a transition to a climate path that is clean energy investments and jobs and, and, and generous transitional support for them. That could really change the dynamic in a dramatic way. Whether it happens or not, it, again, seems to be an open question. Yeah. All right, thanks a lot for joining me, Bob. Great, thank you, Paul. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news. I, I wish we had better news, uh, but we we'll have to kind of call it as we see it here. Um, don't forget the donate button, subscribe and share, and most importantly, get on our email list to go to the website, theanalysis.news, and sign up on the list. Thanks again. <laughs>